Having thought a bit about what decision theory is, just a tiny bit, it would be surely good to think about an objection to it. Now, in order to introduce the objection, I actually want you to think through yourself a choice. Uh, so here's the choice I'm going to give you. I've got an urn here uh, with 90 balls in it, and you know there are 90 balls in it, and you also know that 30 of those balls are red all over. They're just red. Now, the other balls are either black all over or yellow all over, right? So there's 60 of those balls, which I'm not telling you what they are, but they're either black all over or yellow all over. So far, so good? Great. Here's the choice I want you to make. I'm going to select a ball at random, and either you can have £100 if the ball is red or nothing otherwise, or you can have £100 if the ball is black or nothing otherwise. So I'd like you to just take a moment and have a think, which of those two options would you prefer? Okay, great. Very good. Now, I'm going to give you a second choice as well. So you've made that choice, and we'll find out what happens when I pull out the ball. Here's the other choice. I want you to choose between getting £100 if the ball is red or yellow, or £100 if the ball is black or yellow. All right, so just take a moment, have a think. What do you choose between those two? All right, that's great. Now, if we were doing this in a class, which I'd much rather do, uh, we'd be doing this live and having a show of hands and you kind of get a sense of what other people are choosing. Because we can't do that, I would encourage you, if you have the opportunity, just to ask a few people around you to make the same choices between these options and see what they do. Now, what people tend to do in this situation is to take the first of these two options. So they tend to go for the red ball here and they tend to go for the red or uh, the black or yellow option here. Right. Now, in some sense, that's absolutely fine because the options are balanced in such a way that you're just as likely to win no matter what you choose. So in some sense, there's no reason to prefer one over the other. Or so you might think. But this combination of choices, so nevertheless, although there's no reason to choose one over the other, the fact that people do generally choose this one, they do generally go for that one, indicates they prefer this one. And you'll see later that we can make option two slightly more rewarding and people will still tend to choose option one. Right? And the same thing down here with these two pairs. Uh, and here's the second thing. In a sense, these options, this combination of choices with these options shouldn't really work. Right, because in this case, all we've done is added the same thing, all yellow, to both of the choices. But it, fundamentally, what we're really asking you is whether you prefer black or whether you prefer red. Right? It doesn't really matter whether we do that with the two by itself or whether we add in the all yellows. Right? It shouldn't really make any difference. Or so you might think. Right? So this is known as the Ellsberg paradox after Daniel Ellsberg an economist who lived a colourful life. I'll tell you a bit more about that later if you keep watching. Uh, he, he, he spotted that people would make this pattern of choices, and so they do. So they do. Right. Now, I want to tell you in this section not just about the Ellsberg paradox, I also want to illustrate to you how you're going to present an objection. So you'll notice that in the task for the, uh, the assignment this week, uh, you're writing me a little 500 word essay. In the 500 word essay, I'm asking you to introduce and assess an objection. I'm asking you for a little bit more than that, actually. I'm, I'm pushing it a little bit further. But the core of it is introducing and assessing an objection. And it turns out that some people on this course are still learning how to do that. And that's good, right? That's still learning how to do that. To be honest, I'm still learning how to do that. And I've been doing this for a while. I think I've still got room for improvement. But I think the basic pattern should be this. The first thing we need to do is to state the finding. And we've just done that. The next thing we need to do is to state the axiom it contradicts. And here we have to be careful. So sometimes people are like, oh, the Ellsberg paradox, this pattern of decisions, and you're like, I've done it, right? But you haven't really done it until you've identified what's the axiom that's being contradicted. That's what we need to do. Now, uh, earlier when we were thinking about what preferences are, we mentioned the four axioms which are needed in order to derive subjective preferences and subjective probabilities and preferences. Right. So with these four axioms, we can think about subjective preferences and probabilities as constructs of decision theory. So now the question is, well, that pattern of choices 
Which of these axioms has it contradicted? Is it the transitivity axiom? So is there some kind of failure of transitivity in this case? Right? Or is it the completeness axiom? What is it? At this point, I just want you to take a moment and have a think about this. So again, if we were in the class, you'd be turning around, talking to people, and I'd be encouraging you to go back to your notes and look at the handout to consider what the axioms are. So here, what I'd like you to do, pause the video, just sit back, check out what those axioms are from the uh, lecture note earlier, and then work out which one you think is being contradicted by the pattern of findings we've just observed, okay? Interactive. So hopefully, you're gonna be able to do this in a couple of minutes, and I will see you in a couple of minutes. Brilliant, well done. Okay, so if things went well, you correctly identified the independence axiom. If you didn't succeed and identified a different one, you're wrong, and so you haven't fully understood what's going on, so that's good to know. And if you couldn't do this, you haven't fully understood what's going on, and so that's good to know, right? That's good to know. I think it's always good to know what you don't know, and this might be a case of that, or maybe, well done, you got the independence axiom. In any case, this is the axiom that's being contradicted. Now, there's a complication here because uh, I, I've chosen these axioms and these formulations of it because it was the simplest, clearest version I could find, right? And what you'll notice here is I'm not even stating the independence axiom formally, although Steele and Stefansson, my source, uh, do that. So you can find that readily in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy there. Um, so this is how I'm formulating the axioms. But what you'll know is that there are many different ways of formulating the theory that we're interested in, decision theory. We're kind of indifferent between the theories. So if you go back and read Ellsberg's 1961 paper, it's very brilliant and very readable, so it's well worth a look if you have chance. Uh, you'll notice that Elf Ellsberg refers to the Savage formulation, Savage's textbook on statistics, uh, where what we're contradicting is Savage's postulate two, which Savage calls the sure thing principle. That's related to independence, but it's distinct from it. Right. Uh, and it's actually not, not completely trivial to see how those two things are, are related unless you're super good at logic. So um, one of the complications you face here is that you're going to come across different formulations. When people tell you, here's my objection and it contradicts this axiom, it may not be one of the four axioms here. But what I'm hoping is that no matter what you're doing, you can relate it to one of these four axioms as formulated here. Uh, but it may be quite complicated to work out. That could be a problem that you have. And if you do have that problem, uh, it's completely understandable. And the right thing to do might be to consider a different objection where you can more easily work out which axiom it is. In any case, we can't offer a objection to de decision theory unless we're sure we've got a finding that contradicts one of the axioms. So we've got to be clear about what the finding is and the axiom it contradicts. But that's not quite enough because, you know, a lot of people are willing to take my word for it surprisingly. They're willing to say, well, you know, Steve said that this finding contradicts this axiom, so that's fine. But I often get things wrong, and so you really want to be sure, and to explain in your essay, how it is that the finding contradicts the axiom. Now, I chose this example, the Ellsberg paradox, as my objection, partly because in this case it is kind of straightforward, right? So I showed you the structure a moment ago. We've got a choice between red or black, and then we've got a choice between red or yellow, or alternatively, black or yellow. That's the choice. And that is exactly what the uh, axiom is telling us, right? If we prefer red over black, then we should prefer a bet where we win if it's either red or yellow to a bet where we win if it's either black or yellow. So you see how the pattern of choice is here. If you choose option one and option B, you are going against what independence implies. Very clearly, right? Should be very clear. So that should be fairly easy to explain. It should not take too many words if you're choosing this objection, although I'd encourage you to research other objections and present a different objection. The other thing I wanna say about independence is that you can kind of see, so if I give you this and I, I get you to make, and you did, I suppose, let's say you did choose option one and option B, right? So then you're naturally thinking, well, look, maybe there's something wrong with the independence axiom. And that's, that's of course, what, what we're kind of open to considering here. So it's important to see that the independence axiom isn't completely nuts. I'm not saying that this is right, I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's not completely nuts. So for example, if you were a sports person, right, you're into football. Um, I'm not into football, but the World Cup is really kind of good because everybody sort of knows that different countries play in it. Um, and even I know that like Brazil is more likely to win than Wales and that kind of thing. So it's all good. Anyway, um, you imagine here you're going to choose between betting on Brazil or betting on France, right? Um, 
this would be an amazing deal that I'm offering you. Um, in that case, whatever you choose here, let's say you go for Brazil, it would be kind of odd, right, if you then went in this case for France or Ukraine rather than Brazil or Ukraine. That, what would you be doing there, right? So, and that's what independence tell you, tells you. Independence says, look, if you choose Brazil here, then you better choose Brazil or Ukraine here, not France or Ukraine there. And that kind of makes sense, right? This is not a completely crazy axiom. This is not a completely crazy axiom. So when you violate that axiom here, something has gone wrong, right? Something has gone wrong. Uh, it's, it's an interesting objection that we have developed here. All right. Now, Here's my how-to objection. What's the next step here? I need to explain, if possible, why this thing is significant. Now, of course, not everybody will do this. There are different things that you might need to do in the assignment. It's a very short assignment, just those 500 words, uh, no excess. So it might not be possible to squeeze in why it's significant. It might not be the most relevant thing, but it's a good thing to do. And so far, the, it, it's really unclear, right? So why is this axiom of independence so interesting? Now, the Ellsberg objection is, important, I think, because it shows that people often have a kind of way, a way of trading off uncertainty against risk. And indeed, that people sometimes prefer less uncertainty. So if we go back to the, full, the bets that you were facing, why was it that you might be tempted to choose option one here over option two? I think often people are likely to say, well, that's because I know that there's a one third chance. So if I'm asked about the value of this bet, it's very easy for me to say, look, the value of the bet is worth about 33 pounds. So if, if you could choose option one, you could have that for say 20 pounds, that would probably be a good bet, assuming that you value money linearly and you've got a lot of money to lose potentially, you can afford the risk. Um, option one is worth about 33 pounds. Anything less than that, you're getting at a good discount. With option two, it's a lot less clear so it could be that 60 of the balls are black, in which case this is a really great option, or it could be that none of the balls are black, or it could be that 30 of the balls are black, in which case we're indifferent between these two. Now, what we ought to do in this situation, I suppose, is think, well, we've got no idea how many of the balls are black. We've just got no information at all. Uh, so given the array of different outcomes, we can't regard any as more likely than the other. So this bet too is going to be worth 33. But that's a little bit harder to compute, and there's a lot of range of different possibilities. We're considering a wider range of situations. So it may be that option one here is more attractive because we've got a very clear idea about what we're going to do. And of course, this is set up in such a way that option B has that same property. So with option B, you're very quickly like, okay, two thirds chance of getting that 100 pounds here, two and three. I know what the odds are, whereas option A, there is more uncertainty involved here, even if rationally you might think the risks are exactly the same, right? The payoff, the expected payoff is going to be the same. So it looks like people prefer to know what the odds are versus being uncertain about the odds. They prefer that lower range of situations. And in fact, what's really interesting, Gia and colleagues did a study where they offered people bets which had higher payoff, but there was more uncertainty about what the odds might be, or bets with a lower payoff where there was less uncertainty about what the odds might be. And they found that a significant proportion of people tended to go for the bets with a lower payoff, right? So in effect, you might say they were taking greater risks, but they knew what the risks were. They didn't like a situation where they were surely taking less risk, but they were unclear the extent of the risk they were taking. In fact, I'm going to pause over this because this research was even more interesting than that. What these researchers did was to first of all give a group of participants a series of chances to play a lottery, where they created Ellsberg-like situations so that they could observe the Ellsberg effect. But they then educated their participants about the Ellsberg effect and about how it had cost them money, right? So they're like, oh, look, if you'd have chosen these different options, you likely would have earned more money here. And this was an experiment where people actually handed over real cash, right? Not like my lectures, I'm not handing over the real cash here. Sorry about that. So people are getting real cash and then they're being told, look, do you know what, you, you could have got quite a bit more here, right? I, do you know what? And, and it's this Ellsberg paradox, a lot of people fall for it, and they're kind of, you know, they're really briefed on this. And then they're told, oh, hey, let's play this again, right? Let's do it again. So it's kind of a nice idea. What happens if you inform people about this Ellsberg paradox, show them how it's actually costing them money? Will they behave differently? So here's what they did. Here's the structure of their, their lotteries, right? And I'm just giving you one example of these. Uh, so here we've got a 50-50 chance of getting $5, so worth about $2.50. Very good. Now, over here, we've got 
a chance of getting $18. We don't know what the chance is, but we know it's at least one in four, and it may well be higher. It could be three in four, it could be one in two. We don't know. Right? So what's that worth? Well, the absolute minimum that this could be worth is a quarter of $18, which I think is $4.50. So here you've got $2.50, and here you've got at least $4.50. And given that we don't know where the middle is, um, and we have no further information at all, if that's right, then rationally, we should think this is worth about $9, right? This is worth about $9. Uh, so it could be $4.50, it could be nine, it could be all the way up to $13.50, but it's certainly worth quite a bit. So on the face of it, if you're choosing between these, these two, this looks like a good bet. But if you have an aversion to the ambiguity, you could be drawn towards the 50-50, which is more certain. Now these are very smart researchers, so they also notice that uh, there's potentially higher level of risk in the second bet versus the first bet. So they also offer a series of lotteries that just evaluate participants' aversion to risk. So if you're aiming to maximize returns, definitely take the second bet. You're going to come out of the experiment with more money, almost certainly. But if you're very averse to coming out with nothing, right, then you might take the first bet because you're risk averse, right? Assuming that you have a kind of linear preference concerning money, each extra dollar is worth the same amount as that first dollar that you've won. Okay, so very simple structure. So we're gonna give a series of experiments with different odds where you have a chance to gain more if you're accepting the ambiguity or not. Um, teach about the Ellsberg and then give another series of lotteries. What did they find? Well, they found two main things. So one is that educating people about the ambiguity attitude did indeed result in people being more willing to accept lotteries involving uncertainty about what the risks were. So there was a significant difference. These are the two groups post-training compared to pre-training. What you find is that people are significantly more likely to go for the ambiguous but more rewarding lottery. What you also found, which is kind of interesting, is that people also became less risk averse after the training which is kind of relevant because irrelevant because the training wasn't about the risk. So they conclude that awareness of ambiguity aversion, so the Ellsberg effect, reduces it. That's true, so that's good, but it didn't disappear entirely. So there was still a certain amount of ambiguity aversion that they could measure, firstly. And secondly, participants also reduced the aversion to risk, which is kind of irrelevant. So it seems like you know, why would you do that if, if you're being educated about the, the Ellsberg? What we can say here then is that the Ellsberg effect is sufficiently robust that even after you've been educated in it, you will still find a measurable amount of its uh, this ambiguity, aversion to risk. So it seems like this finding is kind of significant. It's telling us that people are really interested in two things. They don't treat them as the same. On the one hand, how risky is this choice? What are the kind of payoffs? On the other hand, how uncertain is the reward structure? And those two things don't seem to be just kind of lined up together. The uncertainty seems to matter to people, perhaps not surprisingly. Now, the last thing to do, and this is not optional when we're considering an objection, is to think about, well, how might people respond to the objection? So what you'll notice is that there are many objections that have been offered to decision theory since the 1950s, I guess, or perhaps even a bit earlier, certainly since the 1950s. And none of those have been regarded as this like decisive game over moment. So we've learned a lot through the process of objections, but we've also learned a lot through considering responses. So as a first response, we ought to consider how Ellsberg himself thought we ought to uh, respond. But just here I thought I would insert this interesting anecdote about Ellsberg's life because uh, Ellsberg was this really interesting researcher. So back when he was doing research in decision theory, this was partly uh, sponsored by the military and it was thought to be useful in various applications. So Ellsberg later, after he did this work on his, his paradox, he was working in the Pentagon and he came across, in the course of his work, some papers which outlined in quite a lot of detail the way that the US government had made decisions in uh, the Vietnam War. And he released those papers, called the Pentagon Papers, to the New York Times, I think, perhaps other newspapers, in 1971. Uh, so this is like decision theory in real life, I guess. Um, and he was, of course, then tried for espionage. Uh, and he faced a very serious 
uh, prison sentence. He probably would have spent more than his whole life in prison if he'd been found guilty. But he was let off on the basis that there was so much misconduct by the government that he couldn't he couldn't be found guilty. Um, so yeah, he lived a he lived an interesting life. But what did he say about his own paradox? What did he think? Well, he thought that whether or not we want to use decision theory predictively or normatively, the postulates of decision theory, he knows them as the savage postulates, of course, which is where we all started, um, they might be improved by avoiding attempts to apply them in certain specifiable circumstances where they do not seem acceptable. So that was a kind of really interesting response to me. He's not saying, look, we should just regard the axiom as false. He's saying, look, it seems like there are situations where it does apply. Perhaps my example with the World Cup betting, which teams are going to win. Independence seems right there. And other situations where he says, look, maybe it's not acceptable. So I guess he's saying that maybe independence just isn't right in these situations. Maybe we should think about, because he's talking about predictive and normative. So maybe he's thinking like, there isn't like anything irrational or any failure of rationality in being averse to these uncertainty. So that was his thought. Now I like this because it's a nice nuanced response, it's kind of subtle, but it does lead us to say there is a problem with decision theory. We're going to have to do some pretty serious work. If we want to say, look, it doesn't really apply in all situations but just in these small ones, well what then is our story about preference? What's our story about? subjective probability and about how decisions are made. So it's nuanced, but it's still creating pretty major problems for us theoretically. A more robust and direct response might be inspired by many of the researchers in this area. So I've already mentioned von Neumann and Morgenstein, who think of this as a way of defining rational behavior. So suppose we think that with an account of decision theory and later game theory, we want to put those together and we want to define rational behavior. Should we be worried by the Ellsberg paradox? Well, we might take the line that Davidson takes. The laws of decision theory, says Donald Davidson, the philosopher, are not empirical generalizations about agents. What they do is define what is meant by being rational. So here you might think, inspired by Davidson, we could take a hard line. You might think we're going to say, look, the Ellsberg paradox shows that people are not rational. But that doesn't show that there's anything wrong with decision theory, because decision theory was trying to characterize what it is to be rational. Now I think that response raises two questions. The first one is whether it's really true that people who take a less ambiguous but more risky option are actually behaving irrationally. Right? Is that somehow a wrong thing to do? And it's sort of hard to insist that it is. So I'm open to the thought that it might be, but I don't think you should just assert that. There's nothing special about the axioms of decision theory that mean they're obviously right. It may well be that, you know, if you don't like ambiguity, why not just avoid it, right? Why not just avoid it? Why is there anything else, right? Why should that, why should that, why should avoiding ambiguity be anything other than like avoiding something that smells bad, right? Um, so, all I want to say here is that this is a substantial question. It's not obvious what the answer is. But if we're going to take the hard line that response two is suggesting, nothing wrong with decision theory, then it seems like the answer to this question has to be yes. And that needs some justification. Another question we can ask is, look, are there other applications of decision theory to which the problem about preferences, sorry, the problem about preferences concerning reducing ambiguity so being more certain about what risks you're taking are, would be an objection. So in effect, when Davidson says the laws of decision theory are not empirical generalizations about all agents, they define what's meant by being rational. He's really focused on like one particular way of thinking about what decision theory might be used for. But as many researchers have mentioned, there are actually a whole variety of potential applications. We might think we want decision theory as a predictive device. We might think that we want decision theory in order to elucidate notions that we can use to replace the rather hard to pin down things like belief and desire. Or we might want decision theory for some other purpose. So we should also consider whether or not this response provides us with a defense of decision theory regardless of the application or whether it's just as it seems to be, a response that only works with one specific application. In which case I think this is an interesting response because once again it shows us that whether or not we have an objection 
to decision theory may very much depend on what we are using decision theory for, the particular application that we have. If we're applying decision theory to characterize being rational, maybe this isn't an objection, I don't know. If we're applying decision theory to making predictions about how ordinary agents behave, it looks much more likely that this will be an objection. So there we go, very good. We've considered responses. So at this point, we've done the whole how to objection thing, but it's always possible to go a little bit deeper. It's always possible to go a little bit deeper. So how might we do that in this case? Well, suppose we were convinced by that normativist response. Decision theory is just characterizing what it is to be rational. How could we then try and build on this kind of objection? Well, we might go to some research by Mandler. Um, so you're probably going to look at the 2005 paper because that's, I've mentioned that here because that's much easier to find. 2001 is a book chapter, essentially covering the same, the same argument. So Mandler makes an interesting argument, which is different from the Elsberg paradox objection. So this would be an argument that might take us a bit deeper, but it's a much harder argument to understand. In essence, Mandler argues what I've quoted here. She says, look, we've got two axioms, completeness and transitivity. Right? So transitivity says that if you prefer A to B and B to C, then you better prefer A to C as well. Whereas completeness says, if I give you any two options, you better have a preference between them. Right? You can be indifferent between the two, but they have to be comparable. So you can't just say, look, they're completely incommensurable. World peace, lifetime supply of chocolate. You can't say to me, Steve, they're just incommensurable. I can't possibly express a preference as between the two. <clears throat> Always got to have a preference. Um, so what Mandler says is, look, if we try and justify these axioms, we can justify completeness if we're trying to think like preference is a matter of just a sequence of choices, right? So then we sort of have to have completeness, that's fine. We can also justify transitivity if we're thinking about well-being, right? So there is genuinely something wrong to prefer A over B, B to C, but then to prefer C to A. People can generate a Dutch book against you. But what Mandler notices is that the justification for transitivity doesn't work in the same way as the justification for completeness. So people might, in many ways fail to have anything wrong with them and exhibit perfect transitivity as long as they don't obey the completeness axiom. That might be okay. On the other hand, once we insist on the completeness axiom, it's not clear that we can also get the argument for transitivity. That's why Mandler says, convincing arguments for the axioms taken together cannot be assembled on either definition. So I think this is a really interesting alternative to the Ellsberg paradox as an objection to decision theory, because it seems to directly target the idea that the normativist has, that Davidson has, that decision theory provides a characterization of what is rational. On the other hand, that's a far more difficult thing to understand and far more advanced. So if we were interested specifically in the normativist thing, we would probably go there. But I'm gonna leave this for you because this is really far beyond what's expected of you on this course. So here's where we are with our objections. It seems to me that we want a little bit of nuance in our thinking here. On the one hand, we know that decision theory and as you'll see, game theory, usually those things are kind of combined in a way, they're really one thing. Um, they've generated some amazing insights. They've generated some actually am absolutely amazing insights. Now we're not gonna pay much attention to the insights that they've generated on this course. That's just come up in passing because we're really focused on philosophical issues in behavioral science. So the applications are a bit beyond that. But I can't resist mentioning this book by O'Connor et al on the origins of inequality because O'Connor provides using really simple bits of game theory, an excellent explanation of why there would be inequality and why inequality is so pervasive. And I think there is a genuine insight that we gain from this theory here. And I think there are many cases that you can point to like that, where we understand aspects of the world that we live in, thanks to these theories. But on the other hand, and this is my kind of genuine dilemma here, there are also some really quite compelling objections. So I do think that the Ellsberg paradox reveals that decision theory is inadequate either as an account of what's rational or as an account of pe how people actually behave. 
So now I'm in this really puzzling situation, right? So game theory depends on decision theory. Decision theory doesn't seem like a good account of how people actually behave. And yet Akona seems to be providing a really brilliant insight by applying that theory. So I'm at this point really struggling. How do I put those two things together? That is a really difficult problem. If I just want to push an objection, my life is pretty simple. If I just want to demonstrate that there's a genuine insight, my life is pretty simple. Putting the two things together is where things get much more difficult, much more difficult. And that's, that's really the challenge that we face in trying to understand decision theory and game theory as tools in the behavioral sciences. It seems like these tools are utterly indispensable, generate brilliant insights, incredibly fruitful, but also obviously and deeply flawed. Hmm. Tricky. In any case, that's your problem, not my problem. What I'm trying to convey here mainly is just that there is a basic pattern that you can follow when considering an objection. And I would encourage you minimally to follow this pattern when you send me the essays this week that I'm very much looking forward to reading.